All right, all right, Red Nation. Today we're gonna be talking about fluoroscopy. So this is our second video on fluoroscopy where we're gonna be talking about magnification modes, comparing image intensifiers to flat panel detectors. We're gonna talk about pulse fluoroscopy and we're gonna talk about spectra and fluoroscopy. So if you haven't seen our video on fluoroscopy basic applications or on image intensifiers, check those ones out as well because they're great background. If you wanna get thinking first about the difference between an image intensifier and a flat panel detector, it's actually helpful to think about the difference between a camera that can use an optical zoom. So like a standard traditional camera, if you have a DSLR camera or a, if you had a film-based camera, these cameras can use an optical zoom wherein they're actually changing what's projecting onto the sensor by actually changing the optics of the lens. So that is actually the best type of magnification that we can do. But nowadays, actually with digital sensors being so much better, if we have really fine sampling in our sensor, we can actually use digital zoom and we can use it fairly effectively. So when this first came out, it wasn't very good. But nowadays on modern iPhones, for instance, you can do the digital zoom where you do this little operation and you're trying to take your picture, you're zooming in, and it's actually not changing the optics on the system, but it's actually changing the sampling of the matrix from the capture on the image sensor to the actual image that it's gonna save. So that's the difference between optical and digital zoom. And a similar thing we're gonna see if we compare the difference between an image intensifier and a flat panel detector. So what are we looking at here? Obviously, even if you just look at this image, you should be able to tell this is an image intensifier, right? We have a circular field of view, and that's because the X-rays are actually coming in, they're incident on our image intensifier, and then we're actually going to be converting those X-rays to light, and then from light to electrons, and then the electrons are gonna come through our image intensifier. We're gonna convert them back to light and capture them with a video camera. That's the same video camera, no matter if we have a full field of view or if we're doing a magnification. What we're showing here is kind of giving you a sense of the pixel size overlapped on top of an image. And this is like our full field of view image. And then if we do a zoom in case where we go to a smaller field of view, so we're actually gonna be using less of a field of view here on our image intensifier, we're actually gonna change the optics. So the things are actually gonna project larger on our video camera. Now we have larger projection of our object and actually the sampling though is remaining the same because it's the same video camera so that is a nice property of this kind of zoom in mode that we have on our image intensifier one downside of this that we talked about in our video on image intensifiers is that because it's less bright here we actually do have to use a higher radiation dose when we're doing these zoom in modes there are trade-offs in our acquisition here on the other hand, a system like a flat panel detector, we're actually taking data digitally and often we're actually binning it because the sensor is actually bigger than the size of the image matrix that we would like to store. So the operation that we often do is you can think of just combining these four pixels and we just add them up and divide by the number of pixels here and that'll give us what we call a binned measurement. If we do this for all the pixels, we'll end up with a matrix size, which is actually one fourth because we had four native detector elements going in to generate one output pixel in the image. So this is an operation that's done a lot of times because the matrix sizes are so large on these systems that they're actually significantly larger than we want to save or review. Here's a flat panel system. I'm showing you kind of the same anatomy for that full field of view, but now if you remember, this is actually gonna be a square or rectangular shape here because we actually have a flat panel detector and that whole flat panel detector is active. We don't have to have a circular region that we're actually gonna use for converting to electrons and then amplifying. That's the difference here with flat panel detectors. And then I'm showing here kind of an overlay of the grid or the size of the detector element. Again, these are just schematics. But you can see on this system, when we zoom in, we can see the size of the actual element is getting larger. So it's not gonna be quite as good. Luckily, we have the fact that in some scenarios, we can actually use the native pixels instead of the bin pixels. So we can actually then get to a higher resolution on the detector. 
for some binned in modes. You can see here, this just represents a smaller detector element size because we're using the native detector elements here rather than doing the binning operation. When we do this interpolation, what we're doing is you can actually see we have two different matrices. So this is our matrix of actual data that we have. So what I'm calling here image pixels versus display pixels. You could also call this detector elements versus image elements. But the idea is we're going from one matrix to another matrix. And in this case, you can see we want to actually what we're calling up sample here. We want to get on the display here. We want to get more pixels than we had in the initial image. What we actually typically do is if we're sitting at one pixel, we're actually going to typically look at, say, the nearest four pixels in the initial image and then we'll estimate the data from there. And I have a video on interpolation if you're interested in that. If you can see in this case, there's gonna be a lot of overlap between the data. If you try and take a really high level of upsampling here, in this case, we have now nine pixels essentially represented by one of our initial pixels. With this high level of upsampling, you're not actually getting real new information in all the pixels. When you look at your images, you're gonna see some kind of visual artifacts in these images when you try and do really high levels of upsampling. And I'll show you what that looks like here. If you take your initial image and then you do an interpolation, you do a zoom in in it just digitally, it looks pretty good still if we just do a zoom in like this and you can see things a little bit better. But then if you try and do a really high level of zoom, then at this point, you're actually seeing some artifacts wherein the edges are not nice and smooth. They're actually a little bit choppy. And this has to do with the fact that we're actually zooming in more than the actual matrix is gonna support. This is just the idea of digital zoom in comparison with the optical zoom that we were talking about. The next thing we wanted to talk about is actually continuous versus pulse fluoroscopy. Why do you wanna do pulse fluoroscopy? If you think about your acquisition here, if you're taking 30 frames a second, then this is the time period here of actually 33 milliseconds. If you take one second and then divide by 30 frames, then you're gonna get 33.3 milliseconds per frame. So the most basic thing to do would actually just be turn your x-rays on, leave them on for that full time, and you would get an acquisition that looks like this. And on this axis, we're plotting what we call the dose rate or how much dose we're giving in a unit time. The dose rate or the amount of dose we can give in a unit time is actually determined by the X-ray system, the X-ray generation and the X-ray tube. If we have the ability to actually deliver more dose in a unit time, what we would actually like to do is deliver that dose more quickly. So if you think about doing splitting up in half, so you would deliver pulse of dose and then you would turn the x-rays off and you deliver a pulse of dose and then you turn the x-rays off this is actually advantageous because you can actually reduce the motion artifacts that you would have in your images and you can even think about doing that again in this case it's about 16 milliseconds in this case it's about 8 milliseconds what i've shown here is actually the case where we want to keep the image quality the same if we did want to reduce the dose that would be possible as well but just in general, the concept here is that we want to have these really quick acquisitions such that you can have the minimum amount of motion in one given frame, but your eye actually can't see things at this rate of 30 frames a second or beyond. So that's why we actually don't need to take more frames in between here. We can take a frame and then have a little bit of dead time that we're actually not taking a frame in. If we displayed the frame that we took and then if we made the display go black that would be very bad because it would look flickering to the user so the idea is that we take the real frame and then we'll take a copy of that frame and we'll show the copy of that frame for a few instances so these duplicate frames will show until we get the next real frame then we get a real frame and then we'll show the copy of the real frame and so on and so on we'll just keep taking real frames and showing the copies, and we're gonna do this such that the user doesn't see a flickering. And your visual system actually can't tell things at this frame rate and beyond. So 
there's not a real advantage of taking more intermediate frames than at this 30 frame per second. Then we're gonna talk about the X-ray spectra. So when we talked about X-ray generation, when we've talked about the KVP, we've talked about this on CT for dual energy, we talk about X-ray spectra a lot and the general characteristics are the same in that you have a region down here that there's some inherent filtration, right? So the very low energies are not passing through but in general, what we're plotting here is the number of X-rays as a function of the X-ray energy. And then the X-ray energy, the maximum one that we can get, that's determined by the KVP of the system. So in the case of fluoroscopy, something that is kind of unique in fluoroscopy, a lot of the time we're interested in iodine imaging. So if we overlay what the attenuation characteristics are for iodine, we overlay that on top of this plot we see something like this. So you can see that the weights are actually gonna be quite high for these photons here, because there's actually a big difference in the X-ray attenuation right here. So we would actually prefer that we get a lot of photons right around here in our X-ray spectra. So if our patient is relatively small, what we'd like to do is actually reduce the KVP such that we can get a higher percentage of the photons right in here. And then also for photons that are below that K edge of iodine, we'd actually like to reduce those. So what we can do is we can add a little more copper filtration. So that helps reduce those photons at the low energy. And we can reduce the photons at the higher energy by reducing the KVP. So in this case, for a smaller patient or a smaller anatomy on the patient that isn't gonna take as much to penetrate, you wanna do something like this, where your spectra is more well-matched with the attenuation characteristics of iodine. On the other hand, if the patient is relatively large and the region that you're trying to go through, you're not gonna be able to penetrate with a lower KVP, like an 80 KVP, then you would need to raise your KVP in order to get the penetration. Because like we say, if you have zero times a million, you still have zero. So you need to get some photons making it through in order to make a good image. And that's the same thing on X-ray, on fluoroscopy, and on CT. We really want to reduce the KVP in the case of iodinated imaging, that we're doing a lot on fluoroscopy, but we need to make sure that we're getting the X-rays through. In order to really understand fluoroscopy and the history of fluoroscopy and the comparison between image intensifiers and flat panel detectors, check out our video on image intensifiers where we go into those in more detail so you can really understand the way that the image intensifier works. Coming up next.